Different kinds of substances have different kinds of properties, which can be used to identify what type of substance this is. This is called qualitative analysis. One of the first things that you can do to test a substance is to test its electrical conductivity. Ionic substances conduct electricity very well when their ions are free to move around. In the liquid phase and aqueous phase, they do conduct. But in the solid phase, where their ions are locked together in solid crystal lattices, they're not able to conduct. Metallic substances will conduct electricity under every possible circumstance. In the case of a metal, it's not ions that are free to move around, it's electrons that are free to move around. Metal atoms freely give up their electrons to other metal atoms, and the electrons are going to move freely through the metal atom. So if you put electricity through one side of a piece of metal, those, those electrons are going to be passed like hot potato from one metal atom to the next, allowing it to conduct electricity because it can directly conduct electrons. In the case of ionic substances, they don't conduct electrons. Their charge that they're conducting is ionic. In the case of metallic, it directly conducts electricity, which is why we use metals to make wires, because wires conduct electricity because they're made of metal. Now, some metals are better conductors than others. Copper's an excellent conductor. Gold's an even better conductor. Some metals aren't all that great at conducting electricity. You choose the better and less expensive metals and more durable metals for your electrical conductivity purposes. Molecular substances, as we said, are made of covalent bonds. And since there's no ions and the electrons are locked into the molecule, they never conduct electricity. Again, later in the year I'm going to explain the one exception, but for now, that's all you need to know. Ionic substances have fully positive and fully negative charges attracting each other. Therefore, they have high melting and boiling points. They take a lot of energy to get those positive and negative ions to separate. Molecules have, at best, partially positive and partially negative charges attracting each other. A partial charge is not as strong as a full charge. Therefore, molecular substances tend to have much lower melting and boiling points. Metallic substances vary quite wildly in terms of their melting and boiling point. One metal, mercury, is a liquid at room temperature. Gallium is a metal that will melt at around body temperature. And some metals require temperatures in excess of 3,000 Kelvin to melt. So you really can't come up with a blanket statement for the melting and boiling point of a metal. Ionic substances are held together by ionic bonds. And molecular substances are held together by covalent bonds. What about metallic substances? Well, they use what's called a metallic bond. Metal atoms can actually not bond with metal atoms of other elements. For example, you're never going to make a compound that's made of two metals bonded together. You can't have a compound of zinc and copper, by the way. You can have an alloy, which is a mixture of zinc and copper. But metal atoms from different elements are not going to chemically bond to each other. Ionic bonds come when a metal loses electrons to a nonmetal and form ions. Metallic substances, as the name would imply, come from metals only. Molecular substances form when two nonmetal atoms share their unpaired valence electrons. Nonmetals only. Now there is one more kind of substance out there that we can have. It's called a network solid. Network solids are held together with covalent bonds, but with a difference. In molecular substances, you have small, separate, distinct particles that can attract together and you can separate from each other. In network solids, there are no molecules. The entire solid is one great big network of nonmetal atoms covalently bonded to each other. For example, diamond. Diamond is made of carbon atoms that have been bonded in a network of covalent bonds with no weak spots. There are no distinct molecules that you can separate. The whole thing is one great big network of covalent bonds. Because they're made of nonmetals, network solids never conduct electricity. And their melting and boiling points, because there are no weak spots and they're held together by the strongest bonds there are, are extremely high. Higher than ionic. You know how they say a diamond is forever? Well, if you try to melt it, you're going to come away pretty dissatisfied.
element type, again, because it's covalently bonded, are nonmetals. You might remember from earth science something called the most hardness scale. This is basically what kind of minerals can scratch what kind of minerals. Well, the very top of the most hardness scale is dominated by network solids. For example, at a most hardness of seven, we have quartz, which is nothing more than silicon dioxide, SiO2. Now, there are no molecules of SiO2. It's just a great big network of silicon bonded to oxygen, bonded to silicon, bonded to oxygen, bonded to silicon, bonded to oxygen, bonded to silicon, bonded to oxygen, in one great big network with no weak spots. Quartz is a very strong network solid. Here is a nice chunk of quartz, this nice hard network solid. And diamond is just a network of carbon atoms. Carbon bonded to carbon bonded to carbon, carbon to carbon. One great big crystal lattice made of covalently bonded carbon atoms. And those are the different kinds of substances that you can have.